everyone, my name is Sabrina King and I am the current president of El Paso Community College's Architecture Society. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and welcoming our final guest lecturer for the spring semester of 2021, Mr. Stephen Hall. Um, I'd also love to thank my mentors, Crystal Lindstrom and Emmanuel Moreno for helping me and the club this whole time and putting everything together. Your help is um, greatly appreciated. I would also like to encourage anyone who's watching this video now on YouTube or live to check out our Instagram and Facebook pages as well as our YouTube for any previous and upcoming events such as interviews and membership if you like, if you're an El Paso Community College student. And um, without further ado, I'd love to uh, pass it on over to my mentor, Mr. Emmanuel Mono. Thank you, Sabrina, for that kind introduction. First, I'd like to thank the students for all their hard work. Through the pandemic, they have found and explored opportunities and came up with a YouTube channel, which they have set up where they are posting interviews that they themselves are conducting with architects and professors across the nation. It is because of their hard work and enthusiasm that we are able to achieve and provide the community with wonderful programs. I would like to thank our Dean and the wonderful architecture faculty who are continuously supportive of these events and the students' efforts. I would also like to thank all the EPCC student clubs, the staff, and in particular, Ms. Arvis Jones, the director of both Student Leadership and Campus Life and Student Government Association for her continued support. It is through them that we get the majority of the funding to make it possible to host these events. Another great source of support and financial backing has been through the El Paso Architectural Foundation and the local AIA chapter. I would like to show them my appreciation as well. They have not failed to support our efforts, whether through donations or volunteering for lectures. If you'd like to make a personal contribution to the Architecture Society and help us continue providing these programs and events, please email me. I will post my email address in the chat and I can give you information as needed. As all of you have come to realize, I don't read out a long curriculum vita that takes half an hour to read, detailing everything about our special guest speaker. At this point, if you are watching, it is because you know the wonderful things they do. I will say that tonight's speaker is extremely special. Many of us could probably relate to playing with dirt as children, and that it may have been the start of our interest in our careers. Our special guest took that experience and turned it into a project that he gave his stu design students at Columbia University. I believe it was called Under the Ground, In the Ground, On the Ground, and Above the Ground. He has written numerous books and has done much with his investigative initiatives that have resulted in him designing buildings in places like New York to Los Angeles, Kansas to Texas, and Colombia to China. I know our program is inspired by his work, given that one of our faculty members worked with his office in a joint venture in New Mexico. Another faculty member gives his students a project called Underground Tomb for Rockstar, and I give my students projects called The Look of Music and The House of Music. He is also in high demand for speaking. We have been trying to get him here for quite a while now. One year, he had a, to decline because he was needed at the Biennale, and of course, who would turn that down? And last year, seemed like he was going to be able to make it, then he was shortlisted for a competition. I will make you wait no further. Please join me in welcoming architect Stephen Hall. Thank you, thank you, Emmanuel. I was thinking about the last time I was in El Paso, which was about 12 years ago. And, and uh, I remember it was about a five hour flight from New York and then I was on my way to Marfa, which is another three hour drive. So it was, yes. a, long, it was a long day. And, and you know, when before this COVID thing came, I was planning to, you know, give the talk and then go to Marfa because I, I, I really love Marfa and I love spending time there. I think it's one of the great places in, in America. Um, and, and I knew Donald Judd and uh, Loretta, Vin, 
Loretta Vincerelli, and they always said, what a great place, this kind of place in Texas. So anyway, now by Zoom, it's a different time that we're living in, and, uh, and that's actually the focus of my talk, Air, Light, and Green Space, Post-COVID Architecture, which I've given a number of times. And uh, I'm gonna hopefully end with a message to students, a message to graduating students. Can I move the first slide? It's not moving here. So this is organized in these different sections, embrace green space and landscape, maximize fresh air and natural light, open circulation and social space, outside simulcast, distance seating, and ecological integration. So I basically, I'm going through a few buildings. These, these issues are things that I've been interested in for a long time. In fact, I gave a series of lectures called Pro Kyoto back in 2001, 20 years ago, it's hard to believe, when, when Bush would not sign the Kyoto Protocol. Now we're really lucky that Biden is going to re reintroduce climate as one of the main issues that we have to face. But during that lecture, I had a chart which I tried to position architecture today. And I had three columns. The first two columns were done by Colin Rowe, where he divided classic and modern architecture into these two, two terms. And I added the right-hand column for the 21st century. And it's funny, this is 20 years ago, but I think these, these terms still apply. For example, classic is absolute, modern is relative, 21st century is interactive. Classic is fixed, modern is stable, 21st century is dynamic. Classic is physical metaphysical, modern is physical real, 21st century is virtual real. Classic is space and time, modern is space time. That's a Siegfried Gideon, of course. But the 21st century is space time information. And I won't read the whole thing, but that I think what's really interesting about kind of meditating and trying to give talks and thinking about architecture is if the ideas hold over 20 years. This building just opened. In fact, because of COVID, we're gonna have another opening in September. It's the Winter Visual Arts Center in Franklin and Marshall College, a small campus in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And this was actually from the interview. I, I, I made a couple sketches and I said, you know, what's really interesting is Benjamin Franklin, one of the founders, this is a very old uh, college, and M Marshall, a man of law, was heavy and Franklin was light, flying his kite for electricity. And that was a nice, nice beginning, but I thought it's a little bit too light. It doesn't have enough depth and relation to exactly the site. So this notion of a kite sitting on some heavy elements took a much more intelligent form when I started to analyze the trees. The trees are the oldest, oldest thing on this campus. Some are 300 years old and they're four feet in diameter. So I took the diameters of the trees and made the, the whole building be a series of concave elements. So this whole kite uh, elevated above, which you can, uh, which allows you to see the Buchanan Park, took on another dimension. There you see a sketch from 2016, where you can see through to the park beyond, and you can see that the the, the tectonics. I do everything on these little five by seven watercolor pads. Here was the idea of using wood, structural wood, and exposing it in the in the in the studios. This is a School of Art, you know, graphic design, painting, sculpture, and art theory. And there you see the, uh, uh, the, the actual wood that they used. Uh, uh, the Amish from Lancaster, Pennsylvania used uh, uh, the, this Douglas fir, TNG, was structural and it's exposed. So the whole building is kind of built like it was drawn in the sketch pads. There you see the program, the drawing studio, the the, the woodworking studio, design studio, the auditorium, which also has a, a real film projection booth, painting studio, printmaking studio. And instead of corridors, we have these big pivot doors and a common, a commons that unites the whole 
school and, and people can you know, enjoy each other's work. There you can see the section where the, the structure is like a box kite sitting on these concrete boxes. There's an actual sketch in the red line uh, is the sort of uh, truss that allows the, the, the steel structure that's the main thing of the, the top part to be very light because of the, the, the very huge uh, depth of the truss section. And there it is under construction. Uh, 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 the building was quite economical oh. because of the nature of this steel lattice. And there it is finished, a trotso ground concrete floor, the, the view to Buchanan Park, and then the, the new campus uh, quadrangle for art on the other side, and then the stairs up to the commons and all the studios. And there you can see the one of the studios and the way the whole structure is exposed, white painted steel and the TNG, the TNG exposed with no finish on it. So, and then the special um, Opalux insulation that's integrated into the channel glass that allows us to not have mullions in the glass. And there's a ramp that connects to the rest of the campus. So the building is very open. And the idea of circulation being open and, the, and not requiring elevators so that you can really reach every part of the building without having to use an elevator. And there's the auditorium and the underside is a powder coat blue reflecting in the, in the uh, pond that collects all the campus rainwater and the building glows at night. There you can feel the way the tree on the right hand side is in, in, in influencing the geometry of the building. And that is a pool that, this is the low point of campus. So that's groundwater retention. Uh, retention. So that's a rainwater recycling pool also acts as a, as a kind of reflecting pool of the building. In Kansas City in 2007, we opened the Nelson Atkins Museum Extension. There you see the original building, a 1933 neoclassical stone building. And they have an enormous collection of, of oriental art. And I had this inspiration from this Chinese painting from the 11th century about the integration, merging landscape and architecture. And here you can feel the way the new building really integrates this landscape. I feel the time we're facing now, landscape becomes incredibly important. In fact, you could even say that this sort of post COVID and climate change period puts landscape at the top of our list of ways to begin thinking about what we're going to build. And here the landscape is integrated one-to-one -one with the new addition. Down, uh, it, this is one of the watercolors from the competition where you can look out on the existing sculpture garden. This is a Noguchi. They have the largest collection of Noguchi pieces in outside of the Noguchi Museum. And there's the, there's the realization of that same space with people outside in the sculpture garden. So you see there at the top, do I have a pointer? I don't have a pointer. Do I have a pointer? So this is, this is the existing building, a big neoclassical uh, pile. And then our, our new addition meanders down the landscape and, and therefore it's all underground connected. And then these lenses form these other sculpture gardens between. And so you see the section lying down. It's some um, 850 feet long. I remember the competition when I, when I mentioned uh, when I was explaining it, and this was a jury, that, which was a fantastic jury, Ada Louise Huxtable, Jay Carter Brown, the director of the National Gallery, um, John Gaunt, Mark Wilson, the director of the museum. And Ada Louise said to me, Stephen, don't you think this building is rather long, rather too long? And I said, have you been to the Louisiana Museum in Denmark? Oh, yes. I said, that's a beautiful integration of landscape and architecture, and it's longer than our proposal. Anyway, we won the competition um, unanimously, and the building now is celebrated 10 years already, and great outdoor space, 
Um, this just opened uh, the year before the pandemic, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, a similar idea where landscape is maybe two thirds of the design of the, of the extension. And this was also a competition. We were up against Dilra Scafidio, uh, Richard Meyer, many, many, many architects, each of which did a kind of object addition to that Edward Durrell Stone building there in the distance, which is the largest performing arts center in America. They have events 360 days a year. And it's a living memorial for JFK. So remember, I mean, this is an important place in Washington and Jefferson Memorial, of course, uh, we all know with, with the wonderful Japanese flowering trees on the way up. Lincoln Memorial, a place of famous uh, meeting and protest along the mall. But the Kennedy Center is a big box. It's a living memorial. So our building is trying in a way to integrate that with landscape and with connections to the other memorials. So there were three, three pavilions, but they're all connected below grade. This ends up being the largest green roof in, the, in, the, in, in Washington, D.C. after it's built. And there you can see a, a grove of 35 ginkgo trees uh, in, the, the, in honor of JFK, the 35th president. And the ginkgo tree um, turns yellow with the beautiful golden leaves right around the 22nd of November when he was assassinated. And you see these green uh, uh, gathering areas, the, 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 the River Pavilion has a, a, a large pond and everything is connected below grade. But, but integrating the landscape first uh, with the original co competition design. I worked as a landscape architect for Lawrence Halperin in San Francisco for three years. So in, in, at a certain point in my life, I also felt I should be a landscape architect. I studied under Richard Hagg at the University of Washington and as, as, as a landscape uh, 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 beginning, he always said to me, be the site, to really understand the site. And here's the river pavilion on the right, the, the Glissando pavilion in the distance, the water gardens, what we did, the, the fountains with the five bronze spouts. And uh, it's just a space of great uh, activity now during the COVID. We're all outside here and they even uh, worked, they even had a uh, snowboarding events in the, in the winter. There's the river pavilion. And you can see the Lincoln Memorial in the distance there. And this big uh, uh, area on the right is a simulcast screen. So it allows you to project with a 50, 000, two 20,000 lumen projectors exactly what's going on in the opera house. So instead of paying $250 a seat, you can see it for free. And that's my daughter at the opening, walking around. There's events. This was before COVID. Um, and now this is COVID time, fall 2020. People are socially distanced, but they have concerts coming out of the River Pavilion. And of course, this is a kind of family bubble sitting on a, on a, a blanket there. And more and more, I could just show all the different events that have been going on. Um, all the all the time that the, the main center, because uh, indoor activities are are closed, has been closed. But this this garden that we made, this sort of merging of landscape and architecture, has proved to be a really important place. And uh, I see that that in the future, designing landscapes integrated into our urban areas are very important. Maximizing fresh air and natural light, something I've done. From the beginning of my work, I believe profoundly in, in natural light is a very important, in fact, one person asked one time, what is your favorite material? And I said, light. And here's the, the doctorate's building in, in the University of Bogota, which is all open air. <clears throat> so because it's always 70 degrees there because of the 8,000 uh, foot elevation, it's, it's, it's a, 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 a strange town that way. It's a, it's, so what it allows you to do in an academic building is really walk inside and outside without divisions. So we thought of a concept that would be inside out and upside down. So the whole building would just kind of unfold itself, making a big portal and forming a quadrangle. And this 
you know, when you have a concept, then I, you, you know, we, we try to study and model for what does that mean? And I'm, this lecture is not about that, but this is central to our work as architects is finding the spatial and, 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 and the spatial energy that's equivalent to an idea. There you see the layout of these classrooms that can be all accessed out on outside walkways. Nobody has to ever be inside and no one ever needs to use an elevator. So it's really an open air project. And it has PV cells to supply all the electricity. It has recycling of the rainwater natural ventilation to all spaces. All of our projects strive for that. And that's that big open portal, which I'll talk about in a, a moment, and a cafe, a roof cafe, at the other end of the axis of that portal. The building is ready to be built. All the working drawings are done, but we've had a delay due to some political mm, mm, machinations at the top of the university, and hopefully that will change. Thinking about housing, I go all the way back to 1991. My first, actually my first uh, block of housing of any consequence, void space, hinge space housing in Fukuoka. And here there are 30 apartments and they're all accessed from outside walkways. So you never have to really walk inside. And they, they revolve around four water gardens. And they interlock like a Japanese puzzle. Every apartment is different. There you see one of the walkways on the right-hand side and the water gardens. This is a, was a very successful project. And I was next door to Rem Kuhlhaus, uh, uh, Mark Mack, of Christian Potsdam Park. And our building was so successful, I was invited to do another block of housing in Japan right after that. And this, is, uh, this, this building will open uh, this year, the, the Rubenstein, uh, uh, Commons for the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, a very important place in Princeton where Einstein, and in fact, did the last 10 years of his work. So our concept was the intertwining of, of nature and science and mathematics, humanity and the arts. So these water gardens are all intertwined with the landscape and the spaces of the building. And the notion of light and how it comes into the building changes. So you have all these different aspects of natural light. And that's a sketch from the competition period, 12, 12, 15. You see this notion of the building is so narrow at one point, you can see the water garden on, on the opposite side while looking at the water garden on this side. And there's the final plan. You see the cafe and conference rooms, a bar, living room. This is where a lot of uh, important studies and conferences would take place, um, such as the work that's going on with CRISPR today, the Jennifer Dodna. Um, I'm working on, on, on a couple of projects that have to do with, with genomics and, 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 the, and the new knowledge of CRISPR. Many different activities occur at this Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, very inter interesting space. And it's basically a one-story building that you can walk through with a mezzanine. That's a computer drawing of the interior studies. Nowadays, of course, uh, we have such capacity in our computer that you can practically render the thing to be built, but that's not built yet. It's the glass had been delayed by COVID uh, backup of material deliveries. Anyway, it will be a very important place. This is Einstein Drive, the approach. That's the original building in the distance with the clock tower on it. We're using the same copper roofs, the same vertigrees copper roofs as the original 1930 full building um, where Einstein's office was. Open circulation and social space. This is the University of Iowa, where the Visual Arts Building in Iowa City was a, a building about multiple centers of light. The building is 300 feet uh, square, so it's quite a large building. And 
we really wanted to bring natural light and ventilation to every part of it. So we carved it out in these seven kind of voids. And there you can see how they interact with art spaces, uh, uh, classrooms, um, a, a program similar to the Winter Arts Building with printmaking, painting, sculpture. And the building negotiates two, two elevations in the campus. So you can enter at this upper level and walk out the other side. And you basically, you're connecting uh, to the dormitory section of campus and to the campus proper. So this is, this is a kind of walkway that goes through the building and many people on the whole campus take this walkway. So that allows uh, inter inter interaction with the art school and they can stop and look at the galleries, enjoy what the students are doing. Multiple centers of light, that was the concept. But how was I gonna activate that? And that was by what I called laminar, uh, a laminar just uh, juxtaposition in the section where the section doesn't align at these places. And at each of these multiple centers is a, is a little a lounge where you can sit on your laptop and work. And there you can see the relation of that building, the new building to our original building um, in 2007, to the Iowa College of Art, Art West. So this was a, a big challenge to build next to a building that you had done 10 years ago. In London in 2017, we opened the Maggie Center, a place for people with terminal cancer. The Maggie concept was initiated by Charles Jenks many years ago. And now there's over 12 of these little buildings where, where architecture is used as a kind of, let's say, joy of life aspect for these people to come there and have a place to meet each other. The concept was a, a thing within a thing within a thing a sort of bamboo inner layer, a structure of very soothing, natural bamboo, a kind of concrete hand, which is the structure, and the outside, a, a musical score, a, 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 a kind of noom notation. Next to this building, and the, the name of the area, St. Barth, is the oldest, one of the oldest cathedrals in the center of London, so old that it, it dates back to the time of monks using uh, noom notation instead of a, a normal musical no, notation. And so I looked at some of those and found these interesting colors and took this idea to give this building a kind of musical concern by inserting these color elements in the Okalux, which I'll show you in a moment. And the building is all uh, 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 traversed in a very simple bamboo stair. So you don't have to use the elevator and has a terrace on the top. There you see the natural bamboo. And there you can see these noom notation embedded between the inner and outer insulation of the Okalux. Something we invented, really, it's a kind of new, new stained glass because that, that fabric of color is very easily inserted in the German factory that produces this stuff. So they could do, they could follow all my strange shapes and do anything and then just, just produce this. And what's interesting is during the daytime like this, it glows from the light from the outside and to the inside. And then in the nighttime, it glows from the inside to the outside. There you see the St. Bart Hospital, the oldest hospital in the United Kingdom, uh, the courtyard. Opening in 2019 was also the Hunters Point Library in Queens. You could, there's, there's the Pepsi Cola sign on the left and the, 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 some a, a beautiful gantry park on the right and all these condominiums. So this services the whole Queens community, Hunters Point Community Library. And we had the idea that the building should be vertical. It could have been horizontal. It could have been one floor. But we said, no, it should be vertical. It should have a view of Manhattan. And when you go up these stairs, there's a balance between the computer and the book. Coming into the building, you look up and you see the bookshelves, but behind along each side is a computer desk where you can be on your laptop. So the building then frees up the site for a park on either side. 
and there's a, a state parks building along the edge, a one-story building that forms the edge of that garden. So the building is a concrete building. Uh, structure is on the outside. There's no columns. So the building is inscribed with the circulation going up the stairs. Or you can read that coming on the east elevation, you can read that there's a children's section, an adult section, and a teen section, three main sections of the building. And there's, I think that was opening day in 2019. So that, that, there's no curtain wall, that's just silver stain on concrete. And there's that moment where you see the books, but the computer desks are behind. And that's the children's library with an incredible view of the Empire State Building. And in fact, you can see Lou Kahn's FDR Memorial from there. And there's just the playful uh, uh, use of bamboo in its natural form. That's the most, one of the most ecological materials you can use. And at night, it kind of glows like a little beacon. Now we get to Texas, one of my favorite states because it's been so good to me. You know, I started, I, I really didn't have any work. Uh, in 1989, I had a show at the Museum of Modern Art because Stuart Rada thought I was a young up and coming architect. I was only 41. And I had my first commission because the Charles and Jesse Price came to that show. They were interviewing Peter Eisenman, Charles Watt, me, Richard Meyer. They're gonna do a house in Dallas. And uh, they said, you know, we want you to do our house. Anyway, that's a different story. But so I've been registered in Texas since 1989. And uh, we were very lucky to win this competition for the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. I hope you, you, you all get a chance to visit this because I'm very proud of the complex of buildings. <clears throat> there, there, there are two main buildings here and the tunnels that connect them. This is the Glassell School of Art, opened in 2018. And there was our competition uh, drawing, which was a key because this was a competition where, and I need my pointer again. Can I, you, can, can you see me? There was, a, there was an art building right here of 40,000 square feet. And, the, and this site belonged to the church. In order to move the parking from this site, they were gonna build a parking garage behind this existing building. And that would be the first thing they would do is build a seven story parking garage. Well, my competitors, Tom Main and Snohetta actually produced designs, you know, with whatever kind of, uh, you know, kind of facade work or whatever. They, they did designs with seven story parking garages. I made this drawing and I said, you shouldn't do that. What you should do is take the courage to build a new glacelle. 40,000 square feet is not big enough. Make an 80,000 square foot school. And by the way, your mission in the beginning in 1920s was education for art. So you would, you would underline that. But by doing that, you could put the parking on a layer underground and not have any parking above ground. And you would also, you would also double, this is a Noguchi sculpture garden, one of the great works of Noguchi that he's ever done. And it's got great, it has Matisse's backs. So you've got to go there. I mean, this is a must visit, this sculpture garden. But I said, when you do this, you will double the size of your sculpture garden and it'll be just a little bit bigger than Dallas. And uh, I think that was, that was the clincher. I got a unanimous vote that we won the competition. There you see the complex now where there's the, the Cullen Sculpture Garden by Noguchi. There's our 19, uh, 2018 Glass Cell School, very simple building. There's the new section of the Sculpture Garden. And this building just opened in November, the, the, the Kinder Building. This is all precast concrete uh, done in Waco, Texas and, and brought in on trucks. And these elements that you're looking at here are the structural elements that support these floors. So this, this floor cannot be poured until these precast, these enormous precast pieces are put in place. And I wanted operable windows natural air in all the studios. So that's what these little squares are. These are all operable windows for the stu studios for the art. <clears throat> and the whole building kind of comes, you enter it at the corner 
And then there's a big a sort of Piranesi-like uh, condition of stairs that really become the center of this space. And now I'm very happy to say that there have been a number of rap uh, performances performed in this space. And you can actually, what was the name of that group? That I forgot the name of that group. Uh, anyway, my wife will bring the name of that group and you can Google it and you will see enormously interesting dancing going on on these blocks and up and down these stairs just because the space provoked. also there's been weddings here already so it's a it's a very interesting school of architecture with one main kind of condition at the knuckle at the at the corner and there you see the 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 concrete pieces and precast what is the name of it the nigerian american rapper toby Nigri. okay all right well, we can, if anybody wants to watch the video, we can send them the, the link. Anyway, you can see a, a, a Chiyida sculpture, one of the first Chiyida sculptures that they acquired many years ago. And I was so lucky that they moved this sculpture to the plaza, that's the new plaza on, on the sculpture plaza for our Glacelle building. And you can almost feel the relation. It's also related to the walls that Noguchi built in the Cullen Sculpture Garden. So there's the whole complex now. Um, there's the original 1929 stone building, the Mies van der Rohe, the only museum in America by Mies. The only time he ever used a curve, but this is the nature of that street. So we answer Mies's curve with a curve here. That's a Moneo building from the year 2000. This is connected by a James Terrell tunnel. We are connected by our Olafur Eliasson tunnel, a beautiful tunnel I'll show you in a minute. That was the competition model. You see, I didn't know what this building would be. I was taking a chance at that point, and, and, you know, because we're radically saying they had to tear this building down and build this new. So at this point, uh, when we won, then I suddenly I had two buildings to do, which was a, it was a great honor. And then we finished the Kinder building, opened in November. And th this is a great museum. Uh, it has incredible collection of art. And the whole building is, you know, made out of, well, the first idea was the big Texas sky, the clouds that push down on concave openings and allow what I call a luminous canopy, this na the, the natural light and how it can animate the studios. You know, I, I've been to the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth uh, three times, and I love the work of Lou Kahn, and I, I love this silverly silvery light there but in a way i couldn't copy anything like that but i wanted to work with light and make it somehow dissolve as it moves across and then the idea of an, of an art museum is also always about circulation how can you really find a way to circulate so that you can close certain galleries while they're being installed that you never backtrack into dead ends and have to walk back through another gallery to get out that you have <laughs> You know, a relief like these seven gardens around the outside give what a, a relief from museum fatigue. So I'm, you know, there, there's just sections of the building. It's a complicated uh, section, but you can see those, those sort of luminous canopy at the top. And this is the tunnel connecting the Glacell School to our, our new um, uh, uh, kinder building. And we made all the sculptural shapes in the tunnel. And then all over Eliason came in and put this strange light. So it, the whole thing becomes an artwork. And the director, Gary Tintero, was saving this mobile by, by uh, Calder. And I never knew it, that this was gonna happen, but this is a, what, one of the only white mo mobiles that Calder did. And he hung it right in the center of the space. So it really is fantastic. It animates the this, this central area of, of all the galleries with this magnificent work by Calder. And you're looking up, you'll see the luminous canopy. And there it breaks open at the top floor. And there you see one of the galleries. This is during COVID time, you can see because they have a mask on. It's an interesting moment that we're living in. You know, we'll always be able to tell when it was hap when whatever it is that was photographed that was happening because all the people are wearing masks. 
there you see some luminous canopy that's also the source of the artificial light. And that was not easy. Hervé de Scott of Observatoire worked years to get the light balance to be perfect. And on the street level, those big uh, live oaks native to Houston, we saved all of them. We moved the building back. We, made, we shrunk the plan to save all the live oak trees. And then you can have a kind of view out from the ground. This is a ground floor sculpture gallery. This is a competition model. And that was when I was thinking about what I call a cold jacket. That is hollow tubes that when the sun hits them, the hot air would rise like the chimney effect and they would bring light into the mid-level galleries. And I'm very excited to say that we achieved it, but it was not easy. It was really hard. And uh, to, to make a long story short, we, you know, there was nobody in America that could make these big 18 inch glass tubes that are like 25 feet high. They, they couldn't be made. And we, that, the people in Spain that could make them, uh, it would cost too much. And Xi'an glass in China could make them and it was on budget. And so then the nerve was, would, the, would, they, would they be all right? And here we are at that moment of the full-size mock. I always require full-size mock-ups on every project so we can test all the things, all the tectonics, the way materials, details, and everything comes together. But here's the cold jacket and it works and the tubes work. And that was like a wonderful moment. So when you go there, you're gonna experience something that's never been done before. And uh, if you're young architects just graduating, I wouldn't try this. I wouldn't try this right away. I've been working on architecture for 40 years. And I think if I would have been too young when I tried doing something like this, they would have probably fired me or whatever, something would have happened. But we did it and we were very proud of it. And it's really spectacular at night and during the day it changes it changes so many different ways uh, the weather the nighttime and it's working as a cold jacket the hot air rises across the face of the building there's a view from the gucci sculpture garden and you can see those those two the balls in the gucci built in 1980 and how we picked those up on the glacelle building to the left and there's the building at night and the whole campus, really. You can see the Mies van der Rohe building on the right, the way he always put those standing beams on the roof, the, the Glacelle on the left and the Kinder building and the Gucci sculpture garden in the center. And the, and the glow is spectacular at night. There's, there's the Mies van der Rohe on the right. So I have been, because I'm one of the old guys, I wasn't vaccinated in time and I didn't get to go to the, I went to the opening virtually only. So I cannot wait uh, to get down there because uh, since it opened in November, I have not been inside the finished building yet. Outside simulcast, distance seating and seats in auditorium is something that we're, we're doing. I talked to you about that, that we can have a simulcast and people can sit outside at, at any distance and watch what's going on in the Opera House at the Kennedy Center. There you see um, actual, this activity was taking, taken before, before COVID, um, the summer that it opened. And we have the similar thing at, in, proposed in Bogota where the auditorium has a simulcast that happens in this big uh, portico. So we activate this loggia shape Ecological integration, which is my last topic, we always take it to the extreme. And here we had the largest geothermal heating and cooling installation in China at the time. And, and this, is a, this is a building which is about, a, 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 about living, working, and recreating in, in the same section of the city. So it, it, it really counters the problem of Beijing, where everybody's in their car and moving back and forth and stuck traffic all the time. Here you can live, you can work and recreate everything. And there you see that the geothermal array here was had never been tried before. It's 100 meters deep. The wells are 10 meters on center. They thought it wouldn't work, but the, the client here was, this was, this was right before the Olympics, the Olympics in 2008. So this was around 2002 when they took the chance 
to put in these wells. And it's working perfectly, heating and cooling 740 apartments, the largest geothermal array in Beijing at the time. And this water here also is all recycled water. The entire, all these apartments have um, uh, gray water recycling that comes to a large zapping tank, an ultraviolet zapping tank. So that whole pond water is perfect and it doesn't smell. The ducks love it, the, the turtles love it. It stays there in the winter, it freezes. Some people can ice skate there. So this water feature at the center of this whole complex become something both ecological and, and enjoyable as a, as a work in landscape. We won the competition for the horizontal skyscraper in Shenzhen and that opened in 2009. And there we, we turned the entire site into a tropical landscape and gave it back to the city of Shenzhen, open to the public and elevated the entire building in floating in the air on a, and this was a diagram for the competition. The, the, it sits right on the ocean in Shenzhen. You can see the ocean and you know, the, there's, in the future, there will be rising tides and flooding, but ocean views are really spectacular. So I said, instead of just making a, a building that kind of rises up to the 35 meters, let's put the whole building up there. 35 meters, you get ocean views, you return the landscape to the city. And also if there's ever flooding and hurricanes things, you'll be free of it up in the air. And also it's a, a, a building about feng shui, you know, wind and water for all the oriental people you they, they probably know that you have your back your north back to the mountains and you're embracing arms to the south and to water so this building is a perfect example a giant example of feng shui and that was the that was the model where we said the building ride rides over the landscape and the landscape is given back to the city and one of the reasons I think that we won, again, I, I said, look, your site is 60,000 square meters. We're raising this above the site, so you're going to keep that as landscape. And we're going to put a green roof on top, which is 15,000 square meters. So building this way, you actually increase the green landscape to 75,000 square meters. And I made the landscape myself. Uh, learning from uh, Carl Bur Burley Marx as a kind of painting with different types of vegetation in different areas and different colors. And of course, the another aspect is the wind blows through. This is a this is a tropical climate in Shenzhen, China, and the wind blows through here, and it creates a magnificent air and shade. Shade is really something positive, and the building is so up in the air so far that plants grow under it. So it's not, it's not a, a, a problem in terms of, you would never build a building like this in New York City, that's for sure. But, but here in Shenzhen, where you have this tropical landscape, it becomes something quite positive. All, all operable windows, you can see them open up on the right, um, geothermally heated and cooled and, and uh, solar panels on the roof. This is also, this was the first, uh, platinum green building in South China. And they're very proud of that. The Vanke International Company is very proud of that. And these are analysis by Matthias Schuler, my consultant always on all our green aspects of our buildings. He analyzes every, every aspect. I think that every facade is treated differently because of the different sun angles. That's some of the planting below. We made special louvers that were the same thickness of palm frond uh, leaves. And they, in, in some cases they operate. So these are all custom louvers. In some cases they operate. And of course, solar uh, power on the roof. And inside all bamboo, wonderful material. There's a company that we work with that, that could make any shape that we wanted. And I came up with this sort of bamboo forest, um, digitally cut screens that can be sl slid. And so you can see out or uh, slow it. They're, here they're closed. So they, they create shade. And at night, the, the structural columns that hold the building up became light fixtures. 
But that wasn't the only thing they do. There's concrete inside there, of course, and there's a cable stay system that's, that's tension cables holding that there are no trusses in this building. But the problem is where all the plumbing coming down then. So I brought it down on the outside of the concrete and I put a, a sandblasted glass cover on clips so you can access the plumbing and get to the, all the services <clears throat> directly behind this. And then we put lights in there and they became, they became the kind of nighttime lighting. So that's kind of my, that's my, my, my lecture, um, uh, which I, I think these points are, I call it post COVID, but in a certain sense, they're, they're good for, for, for a long time. And they, they're something we've been working with. And I, I feel pretty strongly that, that they're a positive thing. And I think we have one more last thing, by the way, it's a little video I made yesterday that it's for students that are graduating. I know some graduating students are there. Can we play this? Graduating Architects 2021, I send this message on Earth Day, a reset after a year of reflecting on the importance of human rebalancing regarding nature. I think landscapes and urban design, new urban designs, are especially important. For example, see the joy in these landscapes at the Kennedy Center reach taken recently. For a year, we have worked from our new building of, for our archive in Rhinebeck, heated and cooled by a single geothermal well 500 feet deep. The end of fossil fuels is on our new horizon. We have enjoyed large and large international connections in giving Zoom lectures on air, light, and green space in eight countries, some lectures with more than 800 attending. Promising new architectural challenges continue now. You are lucky to be graduating architects. Last year, my message included reflecting on my own 1971 graduation during a recession with little work and my turn to producing ideal designs with invented clients, a most important period of thought and reflection for me, developing as an architect. This year, with new work, and I think there's a lot, I advise you to keep your idealism. Consider each place you make could be a mini utopia of the new. Last week, a house client asked I asked a house client if they had any fur further questions, and the husband looked up smiling and asked, what is the meaning of life? Architecture, I shot back immediately, and I said, an ancient Chinese philosopher once said, in life, one must do two things, plant a tree and build a house. Congratulations, graduating architects. You must reset the future. Okay. We open it up for questions. Manuel, are, are you? Thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear the applause. Everybody in the, in the spread across our, our, our building here is applauding. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you have time for uh, questions and answers? Yeah, if, if, yeah, a few minutes. Thank you. Um, so if you have any questions, if you could please, so there's quite a few of you already on here, so if you could, type in your question in the chat. I think that would be the, probably the easiest way to, to handle and make sure that all the questions are answered. Um, I'm gonna start off by asking you, uh, Stephen, if you don't mind, um, where, when was the point that you realized that uh, phenomenology was what really interested you? That happened in 1984. I was, up until that time, I was working with typology and morphology and uh, in a way, I was like an Italian rationalist uh, trying to find an American version of what they were working with. Um, and, and I was on a train ride from Vancouver to Banff. And on that transcontinental train, I sat beside a philosopher uh, and, and he was telling me about Merleau-Ponty and phenomenology. And it just, it was a all night train ride. It would just, and he just talked and talked and I was fascinated. So I always say that train ride was, well, there's a moment in that train ride where there's a spiral tunnel where the train has to negotiate two different elevations in order, they can't just, it can't go up that steep. So the tunnel is a spiral. And when you come out the other side, you're at the other elevation. And I always say that when I went in on that side, I was a rationalist 
and I came out a phenomenologist. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank very you clear very moment. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Um, does anybody have a, uh, a question? Quiet crowd. <laughs> um, Uh, so we have a question from Antonia, and she says, uh, what do we aspiring architects have to do to get where you are? Hard work, 99, like, like I guess it was uh, Einstein who said 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Also, I would say you, you need to be able to throw out a design if you don't like it. In other words, you might have to start over. I've often, I'm often starting over on a project because I don't think the concept is clear enough or deep enough. And therefore the period of design can be quite long. Uh, it could be short if you come with the idea early, but yeah, I think it's, and you know, I, one of the things that's happened for me, I've been very lucky to win a number of competitions. So, even though they're a struggle and they're very painful, that's a way that anybody can, you know, be launched. And in, in, in 1993, when we won the Kiasma competition in Helsinki, my first museum, there were 500 to 16 entries, but we won. And suddenly I had an office, you know? So, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's hard work, inspiration, perseverance, and uh, anyway, I'm not a big, we're not a big office at all. We're small, you know, we're, you know, we're not like Oma or Unstudio or even Zaha was a close friend of mine. We're, we're, we're a tiny office comparatively uh, right now, 30 people. And uh, I don't like a big office. I think it's a wrong, a wrong approach. Uh, uh, small where you can really be involved with every project. And I think also it doesn't matter how big a building is, a, a house, is a nice thing, you know, a house is a wonderful piece of work, a challenge for architects, even interiors. I started my office doing interiors, apartment interiors. Um, the next question I have here is from Palolis. Um, and uh, it says, how do you overcome idealism with real realism? Well, I don't know. I think I, my daughter is five years old and I asked her, can we watch this movie? She said, Baba, I don't want to watch reality. I want to watch my kind of movies, which are cartoons, right? So <laughs> when you're five years old, you don't want any realism. I don't know. I mean, maybe you shouldn't be overcoming it. I think we need to be children again. <laughs> Great. Uh, it says, uh, the attendant, attention to detail, this is from Hector, the attention to detail is phenomenal. How do you go about your process? Well, we insist to, to carry out the full work. We never turn the building over to, to some other, I mean, we never do a design and turn, turn it over to a production architect. We always work as a collaborative team all the way through to the final end. Of course, to do these big buildings, like, you know, we had Kendall Heaton and they were great. Kendall Heaton was a great firm in Houston that helped us build these two buildings. But we were there on the ground with them all the way through and care, caring about every detail all the way through. So I, I think um, we also do that in the work in China. There's a lot of detail attention. And that's just a passion for me. I think you experience a building when you go into it and touch it and see the details, this is really about the real experience of architecture. So to me, it's a very important aspect. Thank you. Uh, Javier Diego asks, what continues to inspire your passion for architectural design? I love architecture. I feel that it's, a, it's the strongest art form. You know, I had some great friends, Arkawa, and Madeline Ginn's no longer with us, but 
they were they were painters, sculptors, but they they always said to me, architecture is the greatest tool of art. If you can make architecture, you know, and and in fact, we teach a class called architecture a propos art. So when you're when you're when you're really feeling the the the, the power of something that raises to the level of thought what you're doing, it's you never lose a passion for it. It's like an artist painting till the day they die. You know, the, the, the passion that the work is a communication of subjective and emotional meaning. And to me, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's why I paint every day. I, I don't, I don't want to build every building. <laughs> it would be too much work and I'd have to have too big an office. But I do enjoy designing uh, even if the building isn't built. And I think it's a work of architecture just because it isn't built like John Haydick said, you know, it, it still exists as a work. I, I think of the work of John Haydick and he, you know, was one of the Texas Rangers. You know, there was a, there's a whole myth about Texas and the work of Colin Rowe and, and, and John Haydick teaching down there, I guess it was in Austin, the Texas Rangers. And uh, he was a friend of mine, John, uh, uh, heading up the Cooper Union. But you, if you think about what he said, about architecture, it still holds. Thank you. Uh, Victoria Trujillo said, asks, how do you see landscape, landscape integration evolving to support the architecture 2030 challenge? Yeah, well, I think I showed that in the Kennedy Center uh, extension a bit and in, 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 the, in the Nelson Atkins Museum a bit, but I think we can go farther. I think that you know, I think every architect should be educated as a landscape architect. You know, I think the, 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 the beginning of a project is crucial. So you need to be, be thinking about landscape right from day one. Uh, the greenery, the, 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 the vegetation, the way we move in and around a building are, are integral to the way we experience the building. So the, to me, the, the, the landscape is, is not it's not something to be added by another figure. I mean, collaboration, yes, but I mean, it needs to be conceived from the very beginning. And I, I think that's gonna, I, I hope that that grows as we move into the future, that young people, because after all, you know, the, the, the greenery that's, that's refreshing our air, the feeling of the butterflies, the birds, the animals that are nurtured by landscapes that are around, they, they, this is something that's important. You know, I worked, I mean, I didn't, I, I, I worked in Seaside in Florida and night and, and the building is 30 years old that I did there. I don't agree with all the historicist uh, bits about Seaside, but the idea of a pedestrian community that's close to it, that you can walk around everywhere and that has landscape integrated into it is pretty, pretty strong. And there was a, there was a, uh, an analysis that proved that there were more birds in that town after they built the town than there were on that site before. So the, the, you could say that, that, that the, the ecological balance could be something that we strive for as architects. You know, I have up here, I have ponds that we have turtles and frogs and we introduce them because they eat the mosquitoes. But we're, we're you know, we have, we introduce lily pads, uh, or water grasses, the turtles and frogs live in them and they're like little ecological laboratories and they're just small uh, uh, ponds. And I think that's part of uh, being an architect. Thank you. Anyway, I have to go to bed because I got to get up and take my daughter horseback riding in the morning. Okay. Well, we understand it's 10 o'clock over there. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. And, and thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate your help and your support. And I look forward to the new school year of 21 to 22. See y'all later. Great job, Professor Moreno. Thank you, thank you very and, much. And, and, the, and the entire society. <laughs>